The goal is to be metabolically flexible. For you to be able to use fats when it's time to use fats and use carbs when it's time to use carbs. The term metabolic flexibility is just like it implies. We want our cells to be flexible. So utilizing a ketogenic diet is great, but maybe it's not something you're supposed to be doing forever. Maybe you're using it just to get your cells adapted. And this is what I've been discovering. I come on and off keto for this very reason. But now there's some really cool science that backs it all up. Okay. Now metabolic flexibility is what I'm going to focus on today. But by the end of this video, you'll have a clear understanding of what it looks like and how you can manipulate it and how you can get the most of it. Okay. But where did the term metabolic flexibility actually come from? I didn't make it up. I can't take credit for that. It came out of a study that was published in the American Journal of Physiology all the way back in 1999. Now this is gonna blow your mind quite a bit. It's pretty wild. It took a look at lean people and obese people, and it simply had them do one thing, fast overnight. That's it. Obese, lean, don't eat overnight. Okay, and then what they did in the morning is they gave them a muscle biopsy test, or they took a muscle biopsy, and then they measured via indirect calorimetry how much they were utilizing in the way of fat energy versus carbohydrate energy. Who was utilizing more fat? Who was utilizing more carbs? The lean people were utilizing significantly more fat for fuel. Just after one night of fasting, the obese people were barely using any fat for fuel. Why is this? Because the obese people were metabolically inflexible and the lean people were metabolically flexible. As soon as they were deprived of glucose, their body just knew it was time to shift gears. So what I'm getting at with this video, what I'll expand on in quite a bit more detail, is that we need a very clear and defined, clear, decisive dis distinction between when our body uses carbs and when our body uses fats. And we want the internal mechanism, a valve, so to speak, to be able to determine that. So does this mean that obese people are unable to burn fat? Of course not. Of course they can burn fat. It just means at the get-go, there's something going on that's preventing them from burning fat. It's preventing you from burning fat, right? It just shows that becoming metabolically flexible is probably more important than even the weight loss in itself. There's another study that's probably even more fascinating, published in the American Journal of Physiology, Endocrinology, and Metabolism. Okay, this again looked at lean people and obese people. It gave the lean people and obese people a high fat meal. And right after the high fat meal, they had them go ahead and do a pretty intense aerobic workout. 70%, okay, 70% of VO2 max. Good hard workout. Guess what? The group that was lean increased their fatty acid utilization during their workout by 25%. The obese group, no change. One meal, one high fat meal, and the lean people's bodies said, oh, cool, let's start using fat for fuel. The obese people, nothing. Okay, you can see how this could be great, right? And it, it, it's almost an unfair advantage. It means that lean people, whenever they go a period of time without eating, their body naturally will say, ah, cool, we'll shift to fats. Whereas obese people, it's a little bit tougher. That's exactly why someone that's leaner can usually lose weight easier than someone that's overweight. It's actually quite interesting. Okay, well, let's break it down more. If we start looking at the gene expression, then we can start getting really granular. So please hear me out on this. I'm not gonna go super, super deep in science. I just get excited about this. So this study, once again, took a look at lean people versus obese people. In lean people, one single high fat meal altered mRNA expression, gene expression, to where it affected what is called PPAR alpha. Okay, PPAR alpha is a signaling protein that further down the line causes more fat loss. It causes more fat burning, it causes more uncoupling proteins, more thermogenesis, okay? One meal is all it took to change gene expression, so at a genetic level, to make it so they burn more fat. Obese people, five days, five days of high fat meals and still no change in PPAR activity. Okay, so what one meal did for lean people, five meal or five days of high fat meals didn't even do for obese people. So I know what you're thinking. It's extremely discouraging. If you're overweight, this makes you wanna throw in the towel because you realize, oh my gosh, there's something going on that's preventing me from losing weight. Well, I encourage you to look at it differently because okay, I was overweight, I was 280 pounds, right? I get it. Okay, you have to look at this differently. This is a positive thing because we've uncovered what could really be a link to this. If we can shift metabolic flexibility, we might be able to 
just systemically, just inherently burn more fat. Okay, and I promise you I'm not trying to push keto. In fact, this video, if anything, it's backing off my keto high horse a little bit because I'm talking about just utilizing carbs and fats. Okay. But the journal Nutrients published a study that eight weeks of a ketogenic diet increases the expression of lipolytic enzymes, basically making it so that things like hormone-sensitive lipase upregulate. So these enzymes, this activity that normally wouldn't be there in, say, an obese individual, eight weeks of keto increases the gene expression at a genetic level of the enzymes that would allow you to utilize fat. So you're only potentially eight weeks away from changing your body or changing your cells into utilizing fats as a fuel. So then the question comes, how long does it really take? And like, can we really get ourselves adapted and truly metabolically flexible? Okay, well, there was another study that took a look at women that had lost weight. They lost a fairly significant amount of weight. And it did the same kind of thing. It fed them high fat meals that wanted to see if they were metabolically flexible. Well, it turns out after they lost weight, they were a little bit more metabolically flexible, but largely still inflexible. Their body still didn't use fats all the way. It started to use them for a couple of days and then it kind of plateaued. It didn't really, really kick into fat utilization gear, which shows that it has nothing to do with the really, really the weight. It's more to do with the cellular change. So we could back up and look at the big picture again and say, well, obese people might have something genetically different at start that we need to manipulate via fat adaptation or manipulate via carb deprivation or manipulate via uh, keto, right? So it's actually a breath of fresh air because it means like, hey, maybe I'm not just lazy and gaining weight. Maybe there is something that's actually affecting me here. So anyway, we look at it like that and it's a breath of fresh air. So it means that we do need to go through periods of time of keto and off. And it's exactly what I kind of do, right? I go through periods of keto to maintain fat adapted and then I go through periods where I'm off of it. So I stay glucose adapted at the same time. By the way, if you are watching this video and you are doing low carb or you wanna check it out, I do wanna pause for a second and give a big shout out to Perfect Keto. Highly recommend you check them out. There's a link down below in the description when it comes down to uh, keto cookies, when it comes down to keto bars, when it comes down to probably my favorite keto collagen. Uh, highly, highly recommend them and you can get a special, pretty aggressive discount by utilizing my link down below. They're a big supporter of this channel and it's not just for keto. My wife's not always keto. She utilizes the collagen, she puts it in yogurt and it tastes delicious. She utilizes the bars, the cookies, things like that. So highly recommend you check them out. Plus they're just all around good company, really good people. I know the owner personally. So highly recommend you check them out down below in the description. You can get some special discounts. Okay, now let's get back to the science. So in order to get yourself truly fat adapted and metabolically flexible, I'm gonna go ahead and say it's probably in the ballpark of two to three months. Okay, we have a standard fat adaptation and then we need to give the mitochondria time to go through what's called uh, biogenesis or half-life, right? It needs to go through, it needs to change, okay? So think of it like this. When your body needs to use glucose, it needs to use glucose. And we don't want it to be a jack of all trades, master of none. We want it to be really good at fats and really good at glucose with a very clear, defined line between the two, okay? Glucose metabolism is used when you are training at a high intensity or you're sprinting or you're lifting weights. Fatty acid utilization, fatty acid oxidation is there when you're going endurance or whatever. You don't wanna be utilizing glucose heavily for your endurance work and you don't wanna be utilizing fats heavily for your high intensity work. You want your body to be able to shift gears really quick, okay? And that's exactly what metabolic flexibility is. So if you are going to get yourself metabolically flexible, this is super important. You do not, and I repeat, do not just add fats to the mix. One could extrapolate stuff from what I'm saying here and say, well, I'll just start adding more fats and get my cells conditioned to use those fats. If your body is not using lipids properly, okay, in all the studies I've talked about, if you're obese and you're not using lipids properly, what's going to happen when you consume excess fats is those fats are going to get stored in a muscle cell and it's going to impair glucose metabolism. When you have fats that are storing in a muscle cell temporarily, then you consume carbohydrates. Those carbohydrates will not get used properly and that's going to lead to insulin resistance and then high levels of blood sugar, which are going to not only lead to potential type 2 diabetes, but more weight gain or at least the inability to lose weight. The only way that you can get your cells fat adapted is by depriving yourself of carbohydrates at some point in time. So whether that's keto or whether it's extended periods of fasting, it's totally your call, but you have to have some form of carbohydrate deprivation, whether just not eating them or fasting, in order for the fat adaptation to occur. It's more important than the fat utilization itself. 
You will get there through carb deprivation. You will not get there through adding lots of fats, okay? That's the wrong way of looking at it. One of the most important things that even at an entry level that you could possibly learn about your body is your mitochondrial function. Mitochondria is the energy powerhouse within the cell. It's critical for everything, fat burning, energy, whatever. Studies are now showing that the mitochondria operates optimally, once again, when it's one or the other, glucose or fat. So that implies you should not be, A, eating a bunch of fats and carbs together, okay, in one meal. You should do one or the other. But it also implies that you should train your body to utilize fats and then train your body to utilize carbs. The way that I do this, fasting. Fasting works perfectly, right? You're going to a period of time without eating carbohydrates, so your body uses fats, and then when you do eat, you eat some carbs. And then your body learns how to use both. What happens is at the mitochondrial level inside the cell, if you're eating fats and carbs and your body's just jack of all trades, master of none, it's sending antagonistic signals, okay? Fats send one particular set of signals, carbs send another set of signals. We want our cells to be able to utilize both. And now there is science that at the cellular level, that is the way to go. I will expand a lot more on this. I think this is it. I think we're figuring it out, okay? And it comes back to, once again, I hate to say it, kind of moderation. Using keto as a tool, using fasting as a tool, but also using carbs as a tool. Okay, one is not your baseline. They're both equal in terms of how you manipulate them. You gotta get flexible. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.